Uh, okay, so any questions about the Morris worm? I think we covered that already. Is that as far as we got? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You said it authenticated itself last, uh, last week. How, how common is that behavior in our worms? Uh, that's a good question. I don't really know. Uh, it's not something you sort of typically read about, but I wouldn't be surprised if today a lot of uh, malware does that sort of stuff. And when we talk about botnets, you know, later on, um, that's a case where you would probably really want to know who's sending the commands, who's talking to you, so you probably would have some sort of authentication in those things, but yeah. <clears throat> Uh, okay, so that was 1988, uh, you know, through the, and that was very early for a worm, okay, and there really wasn't a lot of that sort of thing at that, you know, even after that. So when you say something could have been done in 1988, like, what do you mean? I mean, like, uh, throw away this TCP thing, IP thing that doesn't have any security in it and start over like we did with IPsec, you know, and build some security in from the, from the foundation, you know, build build the architecture with security in mind. It's so much harder to come back after the fact and try to patch in some sort of security architecture to something that was designed without any thought for that in mind. And at that time, with a small number of nodes, if you came up with something like IP version 6, you could have literally closed down the internet, installed, you know, made everybody do IP version 6 and brought it up, you know, the next day or the next week or whatever. Today, you can't do that, right? It's just not possible. So, anyway. Uh, okay, so throughout the 90s, uh, you know, it's basically an era of uh, viruses, okay? So you get infected with a virus through some, some other means. And, and there was a lot of, you know, there's a lot of interesting viruses and whatnot from that period. But let's jump forward a little bit um, to, the, to the next decade. Uh, so 2001, uh, worms became really popular again. Okay, so everybody, all the malware writers wanted to write worms. Okay, and this is kind of a trend, and you kind of see the trend here in these next couple of uh, cases. Okay, so code red, uh, this is 2001. Uh, and in fact, it's something like 250,000 systems in about 15 hours. Okay, and nobody had ever seen anything like that. I mean, that was very rapid. Um, you know, people were shocked, you know, that you could do this. So many systems in so, many, in so, so short of time. Uh, eventually, something like 750,000 systems, but there were a total of, you know, some 6 million that were thought to be vulnerable at the time. So, it, you know, ultimately only got a relatively small percentage. Um, and the attack, you know, the usual sort of thing, right? A buffer overflow. Uh, and it was in some Microsoft server software. Uh, and what it did is once it got access through this buffer overflow attack, it would just sit there and monitor traffic, looking for traffic from other servers that might be running the same software. And then it would go and try to attack those guys if they looked like they might be, uh, uh, that might be worth doing. Okay. <coughs> Uh, so what it did is kind of interesting, at least the original version of it. Uh, it spent the first 19 days of the month trying to spread its infection. Of course, it wants to infect as many sites as possible, right? Uh, then the next eight days, it spent trying to do a distributed denial of service on whitehouse.gov, which is, you know, kind of juvenile if you think about it, because for a couple hours, it's probably going to be bring down the website, and after that, it's going to have no effect, because they will just redirect it somewhere else, right? So, um, it sort of was uh, not all that interesting in what it did. Um, but the interest, maybe the most interesting thing about it is that, uh, and this happens a lot, malware writers picked up on this and made other copies, other variations on it that did things they wanted because it was very powerful, you know, had success, and so they could use that. They could build on that to do other things. In particular, there was some version of it that would just install a trap door on your computer, a back door, so someone could get access, and then it would delete all traces of the, of the virus. That's certainly more serious than this up here, right? So the variants, you know, turn out to be more serious than the original uh, virus itself, or original worm. Uh, and it was, it was kind of a shock. If you read some of the news articles from that time, you know, there were claims that it was a, a beta test for information warfare and all those kind of kind of things. There's really no evidence of that. You know, there was talk like it was, um, the FBI had developed this and, you know, it had escaped when they were doing some testing or something. You know, people just making this stuff up as far as I can tell. Okay, so skip ahead a little bit. Just a couple of years later, another worm comes along, uh, the Slammer worm, and uh, it was even more effective. 
Okay, so it infected something like 75,000 systems in 10 minutes. Okay, now code red, how many systems in how many minutes? It was like 250,000 systems in? 10 hours. Hours, like 10 hours. Okay, now we're talking minutes. Okay, so this is a big step forward. Uh, and if you look at the traffic on the internet, okay, during the initial release of, of this worm, that's what these graphs here are supposed to, supposed to show. Uh, this is in terms of minutes, okay, minutes after release. You see a huge spike in the traffic on the uh, internet, and I don't know why it's missing in the middle there. Just lack of data. Um, and then hours, this shows hours, okay, so you had a huge spike in traffic, and slowly it, it eventually uh, dies down. So again, this is kind of like uh, the Morris worm in that the real problem was that it sent out so much traffic it clogged up the network. Okay, you have this huge increase in traffic and nobody can get their packets through, including the worm itself can't get its packets through. So it's sort of self-limiting in that sense, okay? It just uh, clogged up the network so bad that it couldn't even uh, infect any more systems. Okay, at its peak, uh, it was estimated to be doubling the number of infections every 8.5 seconds. Okay, that's pretty fast, right? So really exponential growth, right? I mean, it's just shooting off uh, off the charts to start with. Uh, and I did see a really interesting talk on this. There was a, a guy from, I think, uh, Cisco who spoke about this. And uh, his conclusion was that it spread too fast, okay, from the virus writer's perspective, right? In other words, by trying to infect as many systems as fast as it possibly could, it started trying to reinfect systems that were already infected. Okay, very familiar, right? Much like the Morris worm. And by doing that, it created so much traffic, right, that it just couldn't even get its own uh, attack packets through. If it had instead, you know, even some simulations it showed, if it had instead slowed down, sort of throttled back a little bit, it could have infected a lot more systems. It would have taken a little bit longer, but it would have hit a lot more systems. Okay. Uh, so it used up too much, uh, too much bandwidth was the thing. Okay, so why was this thing so successful? The main thing was that it was a single UDP packet, a very small UDP packet at that, okay? And at the time, nobody thought you could do this. Okay? Nobody was concerned about a single sporadic UDP packet showing up. And firewalls would basically ignore such a packet. It shows up, okay, who cares, right? We'll just look for more traffic coming from that location. If they start sending a bunch of stuff, we'll be suspicious, right? That something's going on. This one packet, who cares? So it just sort of slipped under the under the radar, and so you know you can see how something like that could be very fast, right? Okay. Okay. So okay. So any questions? So again, the trend here, okay, at that particular time, was that people were sending, creating these uh, versions of malware that were very fast. Okay. So people were very concerned about this problem. You know, someone going to create a, you know, some malware? It's just going to take down the internet in, you know, minutes or even seconds, is that sort of thing uh, possible. Uh, okay, so a Trojan horse, okay, what's a Trojan horse? We mentioned this, I think, last time. Okay, virus, you know, it's um, passive propagation, a worm is active, what's a Trojan? Uh, not necessarily. Yeah, okay, the way we defined it, at least in our usage, is that it does something unexpected. That's pretty generic, right? So, you know, it could be a game that the system administrator plays and in the background it's deleting files, right? So it's doing something you, know, you wouldn't expect it to do. Well, okay, so um, I never get tired of picking on Windows, but, you know, I feel like I should be a little more balanced. So here's a Trojan that was written for the Mac, okay? So here's the deal. You see this uh, particular uh, icon show up. Somebody sends you this freemusic.mp3. What do you do with free music? You can't resist. I mean, it's just irresistible. You click on it, right? Okay, so what's supposed to happen when you click on this thing? Free music. Well, it could be simpler than that, okay? On the Mac, what's supposed to happen when you click on this thing is that it would open up iTunes and then you hear your free music, right? Okay. But what actually happens when you click on this particular icon is something unexpected, okay? 
so you get, uh, you double click on it, iTunes opens, which is what you expect, okay? Uh, and then you get this weird wild laugh. It's laughing at you. Okay, maybe you don't expect that. Uh, and then you get this message box, which is kind of the, the clincher. Okay, so what is this telling you? What is an MP? What is an MP3 file? What is it supposed to be? Music. Music. In other words, it's data. It's a data file. This is not a data file. Okay, it's telling you this is an application. Okay, so if you run an application, an application can do whatever you can do, <coughs> whatever privilege you have, this application could do. So it could have done all sorts of malicious things behind the scenes. It didn't, it was just a proof of concept that you could do this sort of thing. So it's just kind of laughing at you, telling you that uh, you need to be more careful. And if you take a look, you know, here's your free music.mp3 icon, but it tells you it's an application. Okay, but who's gonna check that? Nobody's gonna check that before they double click on their free music, right? But, you know, it's there and it's telling you. Now, it doesn't work anymore. I used to actually demo it on my Mac, but it doesn't work anymore. And one of the revisions of the operating system, they made this a, a little harder to do, apparently. But uh, the concept's good, right? If you can make something look like something it's not, okay, then people might uh, actually uh, run it to uh, um, allow you to do things. Okay, so again, it's an application, so it could have done anything the user has permission to do, right? That's really the point here, right? So if they can get you to run an application, you know, anything you can do, the application can be doing. Okay, so any questions about that? You may get your chance to actually write a Trojan of your very own. Okay. 